Yakuza 2, a game that was running upstream, forced to follow a genre-defining signpost of a game. It had its work cut out for it, but it followed up Yakuza's story with one even more in-depth, complex, and emotionally extensive. Its gameplay would innovate and change along with the story, and its Kiwami remake would have one of the best engines to support it. I want to take an in-depth look at the game, examine every part of it, and determine whether it could live up to the previous entry. Today, I'll be looking at Yakuza 2, talking about gameplay, mechanics, story, and everything in between. If you haven't seen my previous video on the first game in the series, it isn't entirely necessary for your understanding, but it would help if you went and watched that now. If you enjoy the video, be sure to give it a like and subscribe, as it really helps out the channel. You can also support me over on Patreon, where I upload extended cuts of my videos with content that YouTube won't let me upload, as well as monthly updates. Spoiler alert for anything and everything Yakuza 2. Hey dad, it's me, your favorite son, and today I'd like to talk about Yakuza 2. Before we get into the video, I'd like to tell you about today's sponsor, dad, HelloFresh. HelloFresh is a meal delivery service that provides you with fresh, quality produce from the farm to your door in less than a week. They are fantastic, especially for someone like me who doesn't cook very often. I'm a pretty busy guy, so shortening any time that I have to spend in the kitchen is awesome because I get more time to work on videos. They have simple step-by-step -step recipes that are stress-free, which means you spend less time in the kitchen. Also, for those of you that don't want to break the bank, they're 72% cheaper than dining at a restaurant or grocery shopping. Also, the most important thing is they're delicious. In the short amount of time it took me to whip up these burger and fries, I have to say it was definitely worth it. Oh yeah. So go to HelloFresh.com and use code FAVORITESON16 for up to 16 free meals and three surprise gifts. That's HelloFresh.com with code FAVORITESON16 for up to 16 free meals and three surprise gifts. Now back to the video, Dad. In 2006, Yakuza 2 was announced by Sega, promising an improved fighting system and further exploration. Nagoshi himself wanted to provide a deeper, more dramatic storyline and include a love story. Sega wanted to take fan input into account when making the game, which caused them to focus on the battle system. They wanted to make it easier to attack multiple enemies and switch targets mid-combat. They also wanted to expand upon the heat actions included in the game, wanting to make the combat more exciting overall. Hidenori Shoji, the composer of the games, said that the director of the voice recordings wanted the actors to get out of the anime cliches in their VA. He didn't want them to fall in with the same cartoon cadences that were common, breaking the sense of tension. Shoji believed that the choice not to use this overblown acting style led to the distinctive dramatic feel for the series, and that was really hammered on in this entry. The English dub was also cut from this entry, mostly because the Western fans complained that there was no Japanese option in the first game. Sega used the same product placement strategy that they did in the first game, which would just become a staple of the world at a certain point. The in-game marketing, including real ads for real companies, was originally meant to fund the game's expensive production, but now has become another layer of immersion into the world of Yakuza. Yakuza 2 was released on December 7th, 2006 in Japan and September 9th, 2008 in North America for the PlayStation 2. A few notes before we begin. For anyone new to the series, I'd like to quickly explain the structure of my videos for these games. Yakuza is a game known for its story and gameplay fun action games that deliver a dramatic and cinematic tale, simultaneously making you laugh and pulling at your heartstrings. 
It's also known for its plethora of side quests, mini games, and general activities to get lost in around the city. Because of that, I will first journey through the main story of Yakuza 2, analyzing it and its gameplay in depth. After we're done with the main adventure, I'll dive deep into all of the side content included in this entry, because trust me, there's a lot. The second note is about the Yakuza 2 versions. The first game was released on the PlayStation 2, but there was also an HD remaster of the game released for the PlayStation 3, along with the first game on November 1st, 2012. Again, in 2013, a Wii U HD remaster was also released. Finally, in December of 2017, a full Kiwami remake for the game was released. This is the game that I'm going to base most of my review and analysis around as the remake upgrades the game significantly in the graphics department, adds a ton of side content, and even slides in a short new campaign where we play as Majima. It also happens to be my favorite version of the game, and easily one of the best in the entire series, and runs on the new fantastic Dragon Engine, which just looks beautiful. There have been a few things changed and removed from the game though, and we'll be going through those as we get there. The game starts with a flashback to the 80s at a disco in Kamarocho. Jiro, a detective, is infiltrating a nearby building and sees Kazuma shooting a man as he says that they will live on. We're now seeing Kazuma when he was an assassin, alluded to in the first game. The man uses his dying breath to tell Jiro to save his child. Jiro fights into the flames upstairs and finds a mother and her baby. She tries to jump out the window and Jiro convinces her to let him take the child. We see Jiro in his office, Jazz playing in the background, reminiscing on this flashback we just saw. We jump forward to present day, December 14th, 2006, to see Yuya kicking someone out of Stardust. He's confronting some Chinese thugs that are strong-arming clubs into giving them money. Yuya defends the club well, and we get the sense that Kamurocho is starting to go downhill after Kiryu left. Kashiwagi is now patriarch of the Kazuma family, and he gets reports of what happened at Stardust. He doesn't want to get involved because he feels like anything could start a war in the Yakuza at this point. He thinks that the Omi Alliance may have issues with Tarada, one of their four kings being the chairman of the Tojo clan. The feud between the Omi Alliance and the Tojo clan is going to be a lot more than background info in this entry. Kashiwagi ponders on whether to strike or wait for an attack and, again, wishes that Kiryu was still in Kamurocho. A mysterious man is talking to someone on the phone in the Millennium Tower. The organization that he's been with has been biding their time and planning something big. They want to see Kamurocho go up in flames, and the mystery man says to enjoy the show. This opening sequence does a few things. First, it sets up a sequel perfectly, watching the people of Kamurocho wanting for the power and wisdom that Kiryu could bring to their current situation. It also sets the tone at the time, a foreboding cloud over the entire city. Something is in the air. Something is coming. Then we see part of this threat in this mystery man. What is he planning? An atmosphere of fear and waiting and multiple questions. Everything here makes us dangerously curious of what's to come. We get a slight recap of the events from the first game through a dream that Kiryu is having. Haruka wants to visit the graveyard and it seems they've found their peace together. Kiryu and Haruka visit the graves of Yumi, Nishiki, and Kazuma. The fifth chairman of the Tojo clan, Tarada, shows up and his bodyguards warn him that he shouldn't go alone because Kanzai could attack. Some quick geographical explanation here. Kanzai is a western region of Japan and Kanto is an eastern region of Japan, the two housing Osaka and Tokyo respectively. The characters in the game will sometimes refer to the Omi Alliance or just enemies in general as Kanzai. Like when the bodyguards say that Kanzai could attack, they really mean the Omi Alliance. The real-life regions of Kanzai and Kanto have many geographical, cultural, and dialectical differences. They're sort of opposed and have their own small rivalry, which is more based in culture than Yakuza members vying for power and killing each other. 
The reason I include this information is because I found it a little confusing the first time I played the game, so I wanted to clear things up for anyone who was also confused. Tarada doesn't think anyone would be as dishonorable to attack at a graveyard and goes to speak with Kiryu. Tarada wants to make an oath with Chairman Goda of the Omi Alliance in an attempt to avoid a war with them. Tarada reflects on the past year since the first game and says that the structure of the Tojo clan is crumbling. Kiryu doesn't think it will work and doesn't want to interfere, trying to stay out of Yakuza affairs. Regardless of what Tarada thought, some Omi Alliance hitmen show up and shoot the chairman. Kiryu tells Tarada to escape with Haruka and takes them down. Tarada is shot again and he gives Kiryu the peace offering he wrote up for Chairman Goda. With his dying breath, we see the letter being read by the now acting chairwoman, Yayoi Dojima, the wife of Sohai Dojima, who Nishiki killed at the beginning of the first game. We see at this point not only how splintered the Tojo clan has become, but how bare its members are. Majima isn't present during this meeting, but because of the events in the previous game, they lost most of their larger members. Dojima, Nishiki, Kazuma, and Shimano, all the patriarchs of the largest families, died. The remaining members of the Tojo clan don't want to seek peace with the Omi Alliance, and the infighting begins. Kiryu says he's going to Kanzai to deliver the peace offering, but no one thinks they'll agree, not even Kiryu. But he has to see through Tarada's last request. あんた Kiryu thinks that the only one left to rebuild the Tojo clan would be Dojima's son, Daigo, and he wants to see him before he leaves for Kanzai. The chairwoman says Daigo is not who he once was, and we learn that he was in prison five years ago for making a move on Kanzai. Kiryu saves a girl in the city and she tells him that he can find Daigo at Club Shine. One of Daigo's boys calls him Anaki, which is a term for a superior, but can also literally mean older brother. This is a term we're going to hear a lot throughout the games. Daigo's punks take Kiryu outside and he handles them easily. Daigo comes outside and finally talks to Kiryu. Kiryu asks him to come back to the Tojo clan, but he wants to be left alone. He says he's done with people. Kiryu says the Tojo clan needs Daigo, and Daigo blames Kiryu for the state the clan is in. We have to fight him then, our first mini-boss of the game, and it's a slight little difficulty curve. I say that meaning that it's not exactly hard at all, our health bar is just a little short, and we don't really have any upgrades yet, so we have to be conservative with our attacks. After we beat him, Kiryu hands Daigo the peace offering Tarada wrote up. I love this whole sequence, the two men talking in the rain. It builds up each character a lot in a short period of time. We learn that Daigo has changed. He used to be a charismatic man, charming everyone around him, and now because of his father's death and the Tojo clan falling apart, he's changed. We also learn how Daigo sees Kiryu. He punches his problems, but Kiryu is trying to change too coming back to the Tojo clan to take responsibility for last year instead of just running away. It's also just got this entire underlying emotion to it. You can feel the history here between these two. It is palpable. Daigo is also one of my favorite characters, and seeing him be developed throughout the series is fantastic. Also, just look at that drip. 
Daigo says the reason he went to prison was a setup, and he's not going back to the Yakuza before he settles things, and Kiryu decides to help him. The two head on the train, and Daigo gives Kiryu more details of how he was set up. He explains that Ryuji Goda, one of the higher-ranking members of the go clan within the Omi Alliance, baited him into going after them to fight Ryuji, but the cops busted him for carrying a weapon. Now Daigo wants to get back at him for what he did, and after this, the two arrive in Sotenbori. Yakuza 2 introduces this completely new city, a large new mecha completely free for us to explore and packed with just as many things to do as Kamurocho itself. Don't worry though, the game is split between the two cities, so we still get to go back home. Daigo heads to the hotel and Kiryu runs into a man named Kurokawa on the street. This purple-suited man seems to be some sort of info broker and says we can hit him up if we need any. He comes in pretty useful because Kiryu can't get a table at the nearby cabaret club, Grand, and Kurokawa gets us a table using blackmail. Inside, Kiryu hears a ruckus nearby and we're introduced to Ryuji Goda himself. We see how he deals with his men, an iron fist and a short temper. We fight his men and the Dragon of Kanzai and the Dragon of Dojima have their first conversation. Was it? オミレンゴゴリュウカイ二代目のゴダリュウジと申します。し、関西のリュウと呼ばれるのが気に入らんのです。リュウはまだい。関西が嫌なんです。リュウに関西も東島もありゃしません。the festival of a lifetime is about to start in Kamurocho, and I think we've figured out who was on the other end of the phone at the beginning. Ryuji had big plans, not only to take down Kamurocho, but to kill Kiryu, so he can become the one true dragon. But he's a patient man, and his plans have to work themselves out first. He can't fight Kiryu just this moment. This whole scene, this first face-off between the two dragons, sets up the entire story. It's mysterious, filled with subtext and foreboding. Again, more questions that lead to curiosity. Ryuji himself seems powerful, strong, and compelling. Much more importantly, he seems a lot of steps ahead of where we are right now. Daigo and Kiryu's plans have been set ablaze already, and they just got to Sotenbori. And with Ryuji's determination in the forefront, we can tell only one of these men is going to come out of this alive. Kiryu runs through the streets of Sotenbori to see what's going on, and on the screen, we can see that the Millennium Tower has been blown up again. Just the beginning. The fireworks. Back in the city, Jiro is looking up at the tower, and Sudo is watching from his office as well. He says there isn't a link to Kanzai, but he believes other foreign parties may have been involved, but he needs Date. At a meeting between two new characters, Kaoru and Besho, they're asked to take Kiryu in, but Kaoru offers to take care of it so they can get an in on the crime world of Kanto. Kiryu and Daigo head to the Omi HQ the next morning, where he tells him about meeting Ryuji the night before. They meet with Jin Goda, the fifth chairman of the Omi Alliance. He introduces his officer, Takashima. I have to say, I really enjoy the design of the Omi Alliance in contrast to the Tojo clan headquarters. They explain that Tarada's death was not what the Omi wanted, but it was a result of the go Ryu clan, Ryuji Goda's will only. Last year's incident with Jingu was also an act of the go Ryu clan's patriarch. Because the alliance is so large, it has become hard to control, and one family's actions don't represent the entire alliance's will. Jin tells Kiryu that he wants him to rebuild the Tojo clan, and he gives Jin the letter from Tarada. Jin decides to accept the peace talks, and decides to head to Kamurocho himself to bring the groups into peace. Just in case anyone is confused, the Omi Alliance is a lot larger than the Tojo clan at this point, but to make it clear, the Tojo clan and the Omi Alliance are similar hierarchies, but the Omi Alliance is made up of multiple clans, this is the reason for the organization not having control over the go Ryu clan. At this point, the go Ryu storm into the building and stage a coup of sorts. 
Ryuji wants to start a war between the East and the West and ultimately kill Kiryu, leaving only one dragon alive. Daigo decides to deal with Ryuji himself, settling his feud with him, and Kiryu heads to rescue Chairman Goda. Jin apologizes for his son's mistakes, and Daigo couldn't handle the Dragon of Kanzai on his own, so he takes Jin back to the Tojo clan, and we have to fight him. Before we get into the intricacies of our first real boss fight, we should probably get into the combat overall. Yakuza 2's combat system was pretty similar to the first game on the PS2. It didn't really make any sweeping changes, mostly just quality of life upgrades. It added more heat actions and made some adjustments to the targeting system, but nothing really too special. Now, Kiwami 2 compared to Kiwami is a huge change. This is because the Kiwami remake was based off of the Yakuza 0 engine, utilizing that game's combat system mostly. And Kiwami 2 is based off of the Dragon engine, and mostly utilizes Yakuza 6's combat system. Because of that, and I know not everyone is going to agree with this, it has some of the best combat in the entire series. Most of the basic stuff is the same, and will stay the same for most of the series. We can do light attacks and heavy attacks, mixing them up to use finishing moves. We can quick step out of the way of punches and kicks or stand and block. The real separation here is in the upgrade systems and the lack of stances. Kiwami and Zero's stance systems are now gone, replaced with a more focused single stance for Kiryu in this entry. We can still use heat actions by pressing triangle at the correct times, which can be quite finicky in most games. This will see Kiryu delivering a particularly brutal blow to the enemy and taking off a large bit of their health. One of my favorites in this entry can only be done by the Sotenbori River and sees you throwing the enemy over the railing which just insta-kills them. Every time I had to fight multiple enemies down there, I'd just drag them over to the railing and toss them into the water. Super satisfying. We can also hold down the light attack and heavy attack buttons to charge up Kiryu and deliver a more powerful blow. The upgrade system is completely redone in the Dragon Engine. No longer do we get experience points to just spend on skills, we now have five different categories of experience. Strength, Agility, Spirit, Technique, and Charm. For every action in the game, we'll achieve experience, fighting enemies on the street, completing story missions, checking off boxes on our completion list, and eating food. Eating food is a huge part of Yakuza 2's experience system, but I'll get into that a little more during the distractions section. We don't exclusively gain one type of experience from one type of action, but the amount you gain is certainly favored to different actions. You'll gain more strength for fighting activities and charm for the cabaret club completion items and things like that. I just love this system so much, it's miles more interesting than Kiwami's system and just makes gaining new abilities feel a lot more gratifying. If you're ever lacking one type of experience, it probably means you need to do more activities relating to that type of experience and thus forces the player to try a little bit of everything. We can get all manner of life skills which are no longer provided by Bob Utsunomiya, but now through our own skill tree. These will increase our sprint, XP gain, hunger gauge, oh yeah, there's a hunger gauge, and minigame rewards. These upgrades aren't exclusive to abilities either. You can increase your base stats independently from your attacks and heat actions. Each of these base stats also has a point where they need to break through to the next rank, which costs considerably more experience, and a point where all of the stats need a limit break to get to the next level. It's a fantastic system that's, if nothing else, much more visually gratifying. Don't worry, I'm going to gush over Kiwami 2's UI in a bit. On top of that, we can unlock different abilities that can be purchased with experience. These can be unlocked by training with Komaki through a couple different battles, watching tapes at the video store, and even certain sub-stories give them as rewards. The battle system on the Dragon Engine has also been upgraded in its fidelity. The physics system is much better, and delivering a satisfying punch can see an enemy ragdolling into boxes or windows and shattering everything in sight. We can also flow in and out of combat relatively quickly without those pesky pre-battle cutscenes to load everything up. 
Yakuza 2 also places a larger emphasis on weapons than Kiwami. Weapons can be equipped and quick-slotted for faster use. They are also much more powerful than previous entries, and on higher difficulties, weapons and gear will become integral to success. With all that being said, facing Ryuji Goda is our first real challenge in the game, and it's fitting because of the man that he is. I've played all the way through Kiwami 2 a few times now. Dad, this isn't my first rodeo. And every time I get here, I always die a few times, but it always sets me straight. I see this battle outside of Ryuji being stronger because of his presence in the story, a difficulty check. Not even a difficulty check, but a readjusting to this new combat system. Going from Kiwami to Kiwami 2 can be incredibly odd, but after this battle, you're ready for everything that's going to come after. We're not weak, but Ryuji hits pretty hard, and letting him get shots through just doesn't work for us, especially when he's charged up halfway through the battle. After we defeat him, Ryuji wants to fight to the death, but Kiryu says he was already weakened by Daigo, so it wasn't a fair fight. Kaoru shows up with the police force to arrest Kiryu for assault. We see Date walking down a hall when a young cadet approaches him, and we learn that he's made a bit of a name for himself. We also learn that Jiro is a detective with foreign affairs, and the two have very different ideas of how justice is doled out. They head down to the archive room in the third floor basement known as the Scandal Graveyard. It's a forbidden room where secrets are kept. Sudo is downstairs as well as Kurahashi, the Tokyo Metropolitan Police Chief in Foreign Affairs. The team is tracking moves from a foreign mafia and have had their eye on Ryuji for a while now. We hear the conversation with the mystery man from earlier again, and Date is selected for this job because they want him to get close to Kazuki, the owner of Stardust, who is actually named Jin Wu Kang. Kaoru reveals to Kiryu that she only arrested him to put him into protective custody, and the two are promptly shot at by a sniper. Kaoru is hit, and Kiryu has to take her to a nearby bar in Sotenbori called Aoi. We find the bar and the woman who owns the place, Tamiyo, says to get Kaoru back quick. We have to carry her through the streets trying to avoid any people. The more things we bump, the more health she loses. Kiryu returns to Aoi with Kaoru and gets some bandages for Tamiyo. She reveals that she has raised Kaoru since she was a child. Kaoru says she doesn't think the sniper was one of Ryuji's men and she wants us to take the bullet to a mahjong parlor to find more information. Kiryu is turned away at the door and a nearby man asks if we know Janka. Janka is one of the best Mahjong players around, but he got addicted to UFO catcher machines and we have to get his help. We have to catch a prize for him, which took me way longer than I'd like to admit, and he says he'll help us if we get his girl back. Once we beat up some thugs for him, we realize that his girl was a cat and he gives us a special tile that acts as an invitation to the parlor. Inside the parlor, the information broker charges 100,000 yen to get his information. He says the bullet is of Omi origin, specifically Takashima. We see him soon after talking on the phone with the sniper. He wants to keep Kiryu on his trail. He wants to be found because he wants Kiryu to not trust anyone. Takashima is being interrogated by the police but tries to instigate Kiryu before leaving. Kitty wants to know what Takashima is really up to, but the broker wants 300,000 yen. We get some dirt on Isaki relating to almonds, and he decides to give us the information for free. He tells us Takashima has connections to government officials, and he's loyal to the fifth chairman. Asaki gets a call and tells Kiryu to stay, getting a bounty over the phone. We have to defeat the Mahjong men, trashing the place in the process. Isaki tells us that the Sengoku family put the bounty on Kiryu's head. He says that Ryuji, Takashima, and Sengoku are all after him, and in a nice touch, the tile stuck to his head is the Red Dragon. Sengoku gets news that Kiryu made it out of the parlor alive, and he wants to wait for Kiryu to get back to Kamurocho before making any moves. Sengoku plans to spend a billion dollars on something. 
At this point in the game, we get pulled into another story for a moment. Like I said in my previous video, each Yakuza game has a ton of side quests and distractions to get caught up in. Most of the modern games follow a pattern of having two larger mini-games that have stories attached to them as well, and generally more vast than the rest. Kiwami 2 follows the same pattern here. It tries to tie those stories into the main game. We get dragged into the Cabaret Club story, but we don't need any details for the overall plot, so I'm going to save that for later when I explain that whole minigame in depth. Kiryu arrives back at Aoi and overhears Kaoru asking to Mio about her real parents, and Kiryu learns that Kaoru is using Kiryu to get closer to the Tojo clan for that purpose. Then Besho calls Kaoru and wants to speak to Kiryu. He tells him that Chairman Goda and Daigo have been kidnapped. He and Kaoru head back to Kamurocho, and she is still suffering from her injury, so Kiryu takes her back to Sedena. The place closed down. Kashiwagi calls Kiryu and heads to the Tojo clan HQ to update them on the recent events. Kiryu tells them that the people that took Daigo and Jin want to meet him at the Amano building at 1 o'clock that night. The chairwoman wants Koji Shindo to provide backup for Kiryu, but he refuses. As the new patriarch of the Nishiki family, he's still sore about the events from the first game. The chairwoman gives Kiryu the key to a secret warehouse in the HQ that Tarada had kept. We find it by putting the key in a bull statue, and it opens behind a bookcase. This is slightly changed from the first game, as the location in that entry is actually outside behind a wall tapestry. Inside, we find a bunch of different weapons and gear, and it gives Kiryu an idea. Kashiwagi and the chairwoman discuss Shindo's attitude with Kiryu, but they can't do anything, because the Nishiki family is now the biggest force in the Tojo clan after being combined with Shimano's men. Kiryu presents his idea to them to bring Majima back into the fold, but they don't like it. He decides to head to Purgatory, the secret homeless camp hidden in the north end of Kamurocho, but gets attacked by assassins as he leaves the HQ. Before we can go to Purgatory, Kaoru has some things she wants us to pick up while she's recovering, namely underwear and beer. When we get back, Kiryu sees her in her towel and averts his eyes because he's an honest man. She says she's recovering, and Kiryu reveals that he knows her motives. Tojo Kaoru opens up, saying that she was sick when she was a baby, and her real parents passed when she was a child, but she found out this was false when she overheard Tamiyo on the phone one day. Tamiyo refuses to give Kaoru any information, and she ended up joining the force to find out the truth. Kiryu opens up too at this point about learning secrets from the past and says some secrets must be better off kept that way. After some bonding time, Kiryu heads to Purgatory. We find Tamura again who offers information if we need it. Inside of West Park, things have changed. No longer is the sprawling homeless village occupying this area. It's now filled with construction, something new being built. Downstairs, Kiryu means to ask the florist what has happened, but he finds out quickly that someone new has taken over. Majima is back, and he's taken over the office in the florist's stead after he left last year. He started a construction company and is building Kamarocho Hills, a sprawling development complex in place of West Park. Kiryu begs Majima to rejoin the Tojo clan, 
and Majima tells him he'll come back if Kiryu enters the Colosseum. Kiryu fights through two bosses, one being the man Gary Buster Holmes himself, and then Majima. These are pretty simple fights, and at this point in the game, we've strengthened up enough for it to not really matter. One of the only complaints I have with Kiwami 2 overall is that it's a bit easy. It's definitely not as frustrating as the previous remake, as I think most of the bosses have been balanced well enough, but I think it goes a little too far in the simple direction for its own good. Majima thinks someone is setting Kiryu up, and he reveals that he never trusted Tarada. He said that he surrounded himself with yes-men as soon as he took the position of chairman. He sidelined Kashiwagi, and that made Majima leave. I can't help but note that as Majima says not to trust people, we see a koi, or what looks like one, swimming in the fish tank. Nishiki still heavy on Kiryu's mind. An alarm goes off and we get sidelined into the Majima construction story, which I will go over in depth in the end section. Back at Serena, Kiryu asks Kaoru if she's afraid to find the information that she's looking for. それが<笑> Kiryu tells her to use him to discover her past, however she sees fit, even if it goes against the Tojo clan. Kiryu isn't proud of his life as a Yakuza, and seems like he's had time to reflect on the past. He's much more contemplative, and after losing so much, he has to have regrets. Kaoru leaves, Kiryu following behind. Date and Jiro are at Stardust, being served by Yuya. They remember the events of the past year, and Kazuki arrives, Date introducing him to Jiro. Kazuki seems apprehensive, wondering why Jiro is here. Date tells him that investigators are going to be bursting in here soon, as they're doing raids on a lot of suspicious businesses around town, looking for the perpetrators of the Millennium Tower bombing. Date tells Kazuki he's giving him this information as repayment for causing a scene in Stardust during the events of the previous game. We quickly learn that it was all a ploy to see if Kazuki contacts anyone, which he does and quickly runs out of Stardust. Kaoru and Kiryu head to the Amano building with information from Tomora. A gang named 16-Bit normally occupies the place, but they've been kicked out by a foreign organization, and their leader is too busy playing a Nintendo Switch to care. After defeating the men, we get the key to the Amano building. We make our way through the place, a raid-style battle. I think Kiwami 2's battle system pairs a lot better with these dungeon-style levels than Kiwami's did. Since fighting is much quicker and more fast-paced, it feels like a natural extension of the system itself. After making it through the building, Kiryu arrives on the roof, finding Jiro, Date, and two Kazukis. They're both trying to convince the group that they're the real Kazuki, and Jiro seems to think he's decided the fake. Date aims his gun at Jiro, and while distracted, the fake Kazuki pulls two guns out and shoots the real Kazuki and Jiro. He was the one who called Kiryu, and he plans to kill all of them. So you monster. <laughs> Uh, 
they all decide to run as it seems fishy. Now, since that was a lot, Dad, I'd like to take a little breather and visit the music of Yakuza 2 briefly. As I've said before, every Yakuza game has some amount of fantastic tracks. Push Me Underwater is an absolute slap that rips through the speakers with a funky bass track and rough guitars. Outlaw's Lullaby is an upbeat, ridiculous jazz track that is led by a screaming trumpet and flattering drums, the occasional piano pushing through to get its time in the spotlight. The PS2 version of the soundtrack is a lot more stripped back, but it's great in its own way. It seems to take its time a little more, building to these huge crescendos and not afraid to let us dwell on the music a little bit. Face to Face is a fantastic rhythm track with a constant thrum of the guitar that switches up halfway through and introduces some interesting synths into the mix. The whole soundtrack for both games just furthers the story and the idea that we're going for here. High intensity action mixed with and separated by these deep emotional scenes. Every track lends something to the game itself and works with it, not against it. The real Kazuki and Jiro are bleeding out from their wounds, so we have another sequence where we have to carry them through the city, avoiding police and trying not to bump them against anything, causing further bleed outs. We take the two to a doctor that Kiryu knows, and he says he'll patch up Kazuki and Jiro, but Date and Kiryu should leave to lay low. Yuya says that he heard about Kazuki, and the boys tell him to head back and worry about Stardust. Date and Kiryu head to the bar that used to be Bacchus, now called Bantam, and have the bartender close the place so they can have a private conversation. Date tells Kiryu about Besho and Jiro. They used to be legendary, Besho the Viper and Kawada the Demon. Date holds a grudge against Kawada because they had been tracking down a murder suspect and Jiro gunned down some immigrants. He mowed them down and had a reputation for shooting first and asking questions later. Kaoru calls Kiryu and scalds him for being at the bar, and he checks back in on her at the clinic. Jiro and Kaoru are talking. Jiro is clearly trying to probe her. Some men arrive speaking Korean and think that Kazuki is a man named Kong. We battle them and they say they're part of the Jingwon Mafia. They head over to Bantam and tell Date what happened. Jiro tells us what Jingwan means in Korean, Jin meaning true, Guan meaning fist, and faction meaning pa. Though this is a Japanese reading and not entirely accurate. The Jingwan will be important in multiple games. They're not like the Yakuza, they're a mafia, which is technically different, putting absolute loyalty above everything else. They seem to be the ones who have taken Chairman Goda and Daigo captive. The barkeep reveals that he's been working with someone to kill Kiryu and begs him to let them do it, so they all don't have to die, but we beat them down anyways. We find out it was the Sengoku family putting a bounty on their heads. Everyone is after him at this point in the story. Kiryu has nowhere to turn. The Omi Alliance is hot on his heels. Takashima and Sengoku both sending people after him. The Jingwan Mafia has men in the mix, and they've even kidnapped both people instrumental to his plot to rebuild the Tojo clan. The Tojo clan itself is in shambles and is virtually no help to him at this point. Why are they all after him? because they know that Kiryu is the only one that has the ability to rebuild the Tojo clan back to its former glory, back to an organization that can truly be a force to be reckoned with. Kiryu forgives the bartender and tells him about the value of a bar. 
Kiryu meets everyone at Sedona, and they tell him that Date is wanted for murder. The surveillance cameras at the Amano building picked him up, firing his gun. The police are talking about Date's involvement in the recent incident and say they're tracking the Jingwan Mafia in the city. The officer then says that Division 4 and Foreign Affairs are off the case. Kurahashi says he'll think of something to get Date out of this as he feels responsible for getting him involved. The group are deciding if Date can actually be implicated and that the footage must have come from the florist himself, who now has an office in the Millennium Tower. Kiryu decides to head for the florist and have Date leave town for a while. A big feature and advantage of this game, and mostly every Yakuza entry, is how immersive of a cityscape it creates. It exemplifies what it would feel like to walk around an actual city in Japan, or even a city at all. Kamurocho in particular feels like a living, breathing place. You can feel the pulse from the neon signs, hear the breathing of asphalt beneath your feet, and feel the heartbeat of shops and restaurants around every corner. It's a fantastic place to just wander around in. When I first played Yakuza, people told me to just play with the minimap off, because eventually you would learn the city so well that you would know where to go. I can't say I ever actually did that, but at a certain point, I wouldn't even have to look at the map to know where Pink Street was or Tenkaichi Boulevard. The city itself is the perfect size, and this extends to Sotenbori. It's not too large that you feel you can't become familiar with it, but it's not so small that you're left unimpressed. It plays around with this middle area where you're both stunned at the detail and also incredibly familiar with every nook and cranny after spending hundreds of hours across all varieties of Kamurocho. This level of detail is also probably at its peak in Kiwami 2. We can seamlessly enter shops and businesses without a loading screen or waiting for anything. Every sign, NPC, and piece of street feels detailed and like it had time and effort put into it. It's a fantastic place that I always want to journey back to no matter what. It almost feels like home. Kiryu heads to the Millennium Tower and finds the florist's new setup. He already knows everything there is to know about Kaoru. He reveals that he's been having a spy issue for a while in his organization, and that he's been watching Daigo for a long time. The system is hijacked and the power goes out. Kiryu fends off the attackers and comes face to face with Hayashi, the man that attacked him in Eddie's during the first game. He's working for the go Ryu clan now, and we fight him in a pretty trying battle. He's our first boss with a massive health bar, and it takes a while to get him down. When the power is turned back on, we see the mystery man from earlier is working for the florist, assumingly the spy in his organization. He hacks the system, but Kaoru is an expert and gets the cameras working. They find out that Daigo was taken to Shangri-La. We make our way through the building and eventually reach Daigo, tied up on a bed, unharmed. The group is reorganizing at Serena when Kashiwagi shows up to check on Daigo. The police have destroyed their records on the Jingwan Mafia, revealing that the corruption goes up far higher than we've thought. We see a flashback to Kazuma, Shimano, and Dojima 20 years ago, all plotting to take down the Jingwan, to allow the Dojima family to gain more ground. Kazuma was against the plan, but the Dojima would have crumbled if they didn't strike. They attacked the Jingwan base and killed every one of them. This momentum was used to spread the Tojo clan all over Kanto. Some of them must have lived because the Jingwan Mafia is still surviving on today. Tarada's funeral is the next day, and Kiryu has to make an appearance, also using it as a chance to update the chairwoman on the recent events. They decide the main priority is getting Chairman Gota freed and establishing the alliance between the Omi and the Tojo. There's a disturbance outside, and Kiryu investigates it to find the go Ryu clan attacking. After they defeat the men, Ryuji shows himself. go Ryuji. おはよう、キリュウ。
おめえの証拠など受けられねえとっとと帰れさっきからおっかない顔しとるけどあんた何もんやバカ頭対抗の柏木だほんまでっかわしはてっきり葬儀屋のおっさんかと思ってました<笑> He disgraces the deceased chairman right after and offers them money to stop the alliance between the clans. He says he wants a rematch with Kiryu in three days and wants to know what Son Goku is up to in Kamurocho before departing the funeral. Majima faces off a ton of men in Kamurocho by himself, defending the city solo, and Kiryu arrives back in Kamurocho. Kiryu wants to track down Son Goku and figure out what he's up to. When Kiryu is walking around town, he finds a beaten and bloodied Majima. なぜだ連中街中でヘリ飛ばしたり兵隊を行進させたりしたのはキリュウちゃんをここにおびき出すためやマジマ again exhibits insane strength and determination fending off against hundreds of men by himself a lone and insane beast only the wind knowing his true motivations One thing I really want to touch on quickly that is one of my favorite upgrades to Kiwami 2 is the UI. This thing is probably one of my favorite game UIs ever. It's so clean and perfect. Even the sound ties in well, the pop ups. It feels a crisp, new, shining thing that reflects the Dragon Engine itself and how ahead of the rest it is. It's fantastic. Everything feels like it makes sense, and there's never a moment where I have a complaint about how it works. I will say it could use a little more style, but overall, I think this new, clean design is fantastic and easily my favorite of the series. When we reach the Tojo HQ, we find out that the Nishiki family has taken over the place. Shindo has captured the chairwoman and is working for the Go Diu clan. Sengoku has sent hitmen out to wipe out Tojo clan officers, and Shindo decides he wants to take over as chairman and take the chairwoman for himself. We have to fight him, and I just have to say, I hate Koji Shindo. Not as a boss fight, but as a character. He's the biggest bitch the Tojo clan has ever seen. He betrayed everyone for power. Then, when we fight him, he runs away the entire time. Then, when we think he's dead, he tries to sneak up on us and take Kiryu out from behind, and we have to fight him a second time. Daigo shoots Shindo, and the chairwoman declares full on war. No more Omi men left in Kamurocho. We see a flashback of Jiro and Date investigating the Jingwan Mafia, and we find out Jiro knew about them. Jiro leaves the case because he owes the Jingwan. Date is telling Kaoru and Kiryu about it on the roof of Sedena. Kiryu tells Date to drop the case, and he refuses. Kaoru feels betrayed by the police force at this point, being lied to all this time. Kiryu says he needs to go to Kanzai to find Jin and save the Omi Alliance chairman. Walking through town, Kiryu runs into Takashi, the florist's son from the first game, but he's with a new girl. They have a drink, and Takashi tells him that Kiyoka has been cheating on him, and he needs to see the florist of Sai to find out for sure, not knowing it's his own father. The florist decides not to tell Takashi he is his father, and shows him the footage he wants to see of Kiyoka. She's actually meeting with her father to borrow money while Takashi looks for a job, not cheating on him. He tells Takashi when he can support himself, he can come back and learn about his father. We meet Kaoru over at Sedena. She feels betrayed by Besho and she wants to stop at Osaka PD. She still has control over him, Kiryu technically in protective custody. Besho reveals that the police force had the Dojima family take out the Jingwan Mafia for them. Only 33 of 36 bodies were ever found, though, the possibility of three surviving members. One survivor is in Kaima, outside of the city, by the name of Murai. 
We finally get a view here of why people hate the Jingwan Mafia. They're brutal and always out for blood. They're different from the Yakuza. Death before dishonor. Besho takes Kiryu out of protective custody and tells him to take care of Kaoru as she runs off. We find her wandering near the river being harassed by a group of men. The police show up and the two are forced to run, Kaoru seeming to enjoy the chase, at least with Kiryu. The two spend a night on the town, a nice montage of Kiryu actually enjoying himself for once. Kaoru takes him to her secret spot on a roof and Kiryu says he thinks she's a kind soul. They decide to meet in the morning and Kaoru takes the bear that Kiryu won her. While exploring the town, Kiryu finds a tattoo artist throwing away a design in the water. He tells Kiryu about the design, the Golden Dragon, only the acting Kazahori has the right to use it, which is him. One of his pupils bursts in and says Satoshi stole the design. He's a disgruntled man that trains under Kazahori and couldn't handle that he wouldn't be the next in line to head up the business. We learn that the Golden Dragon is currently on Ryuji Goda's back, but Kazahori didn't ink it. Akina did. Kiryu shows them his tattoo, and we learn that he believes their battle has to be fate. The next morning, Kaoru wonders if she was one of the Jingwan survivors, but she wants to learn the truth regardless. We have to move around the city and investigate different leads, a trail of clues eventually leading back to an underground shoji parlor. Now, this is a big difference in Kiwami 2 compared to the first game. A lot of this story and some things that were removed takes place in an entire other area that was cut from the game called Shinsaicho. This was based on the real-life Shinsekai district. Yakuza 2 was the only game that it ever appeared in, and to be fair, it's a pretty small area. There are a fair amount of sub-stories in the area that also got cut with it, but overall it makes sense. I've seen a lot of people get upset with this removal, but we only journey to this area once in Chapter 11, and it would have taken a lot of extra resources and budget to recreate this small strip of city. The backgrounds, shops, NPCs, it would have been a lot. Just to spend a short period of time there, it probably made more sense to just have similar events take place in Sotenbori. Though I have to admit, it would have been cool to see the tower and Shinsekai as a whole in the Dragon Engine. Murai is reluctant to give details about the Jingwan, but he eventually tells Kiryu and Kaoru that the raid took place on Christmas. The Dojima family came in and began killing everyone, and afterwards, Murai had to sell out the other two survivors to stay alive, a woman and her child. We get a flashback to that night, the same we saw at the beginning of the game. Shimano shoots Murai, but he managed to survive. Kiryu believes that the child is Kaoru herself. Murai says that Kazuma killed her father, the boss of the Jingwan. Kiryu says he was there too, and then the Jingwan stormed the parlor. They reveal that they were behind the bombings and kidnappings, and Kiryu defeats them. They use their final act to kill Murai as he deserted the Jingwan, and they all off themselves, taking cyanide or some other type of poison. Murai regrets not dying that night with his dying breath, but is glad that Kaoru grew up well. She runs away and Kiryu finds her, telling her what he remembers from that night. He was heading to the Dojima family office to find Kazuma, as he always came to Sunflower on Christmas, but he was missing that day. We get to see a young Kiryu looking dripped out for the 80s. Kiryu tracked Kazuma and thought him to be in danger, but in reality, he was going to let the Jingwan escape. Kiryu burst in to save Kazuma, and Kazuma was forced to shoot and kill the Mafia boss to save him. Kiryu feels responsible for killing Kaoru's father, though he was not the one to pull the trigger. Kaoru runs off and Kiryu spends his night at the river, smoking and standing in the rain. For some reason, I just really love this contemplative, kind of sad Kiryu. It's hard to see a man so strong and powerful regret his past and be affected by the only thing he can't punch his way out of, his past. A man comes along and stabs Kiryu in the stomach, and he's bleeding out. Twice now throughout this second entry, we've had to carry other people as they were wounded and get them to safety as soon as possible. I always thought these sequences were odd, but when this part of the game started, it immediately made sense. 
Now we have to get Kiryu to Aoi before he collapses. The same gameplay as before, but he doesn't have to carry anyone else anymore. He has to carry himself. It's genius and just works so well at this point in the game. He gets to Aoi and collapses as soon as he gets inside. Sengoku tells Ryuji that he has plans to lure Kiryu out and take his head to get control of the Omi Alliance, and reveals that he has Haruka captive. Ryuji doesn't agree and wants to deal with Kiryu in his own way. Back at Aoi, Kiryu gets word that Haruka has been captured by Sengoku. He gets a call and heads to the golf center, which results in a dead end. He eventually goes back to Kurokawa for information, but Kiryu's head has too much money on it and he turns on him. He tracks down Asaki, who is the one who put a hit out on him in the first place, but Kiryu gets a call from Sengoku and wants him to head to Osaka Castle. When we get there, we have to suspend our disbelief a little because a golden castle appears from inside of the other castle. But suspending your disbelief shouldn't be too hard because Kiryu is constantly emitting light particles from himself and beating the shit out of hundreds of dudes at once. So We charge through the castle, taking down ninjas, samurais, and eventually fighting two tigers with our bare hands, which is so badass. At the top of the castle, Sengoku has Haruka, but Ryuji gets upset that he took a child hostage. It crosses a line for him and he kills Sengoku, pushing him off of the tower. Ryuji returns Haruka to Kiryu and tells him he's still coming for him. Kiryu collapses after his wound reopened and Kaoru rescues him, having followed him to the castle. Jiro is looking on from a distance. Back at Aoi, Kiryu is recovering and Kaoru finds a note from Tamiyo saying that her father is still alive. Since Kaoru is gone, Kiryu decides to take Haruka to explore Sotenbori. They run into a producer who wants Haruka to be his new star idol. The most interesting part of this little run off the main path is that Kiryu reflects on whether Haruka would be better off in someone else's hands, away from the Yakuza and his dangerous life entirely. Haruka doesn't seem to want to be an idol, and when at a bar, Kiryu finds a woman who has a lovely voice. The producer signs her in place of Haruka, and the two return to Aoi. Kiryu gets a call from Kurahashi and says that 20 years ago, he was known as Yang Min Ji. He was one of the Jongwin survivors and is working with them now. He wants to get vengeance for the raid all those years ago, and they're using Date as bait. He wants Kaoru to be there too, and they head to Kamurocho, making their way to the Millennium Tower. On the way, Jiro is talking to Besho, trying to coordinate a defense, also heading to the Millennium Tower. We get a sequence where the Jingwan are tracking Kiryu and he jumps out of the car and we fight men on moving trucks. The sequence was so cool and throwing dudes off of a moving trailer just feels so satisfying. Kiryu drops Haruka off at Sedena and heads to the Millennium Tower. They find Kurahashi on the 50th floor and he's rigged the place with explosives. Jiro arrives and says that he's always suspected Kurahashi, tracking his every move. <laughs> we find out that Kaoru is Jiro's daughter, and Kurahashi shoots him. Jiro had a child with the Jingwan boss's wife and puts more bullets into him. Kaoru shoots the mystery man from before, and he runs away. Kiryu puts an end to Kurahashi, defeating him in battle. Kurahashi tries to shoot at the switch to blow up the tower, but Kaoru tries to take the bullet, and Jiro takes it for her, landing the final shot on Kurahashi. We learn about Jiro's past and how he met Kaoru's mother. Jiro tried to help her build a new life after the fire, and he was only supposed to be gone for a year on work, but then the raid happened. 
She gave Kaoru to Tamiyo, someone with no connections to the Jingwan, so she couldn't be traced back, and Jiro was forced to stay away. Jiro and Karu get to spend one last moment together before he dies. There are still some loose ends, and Date wonders about the other child that Kaoru's mother gave up. Date has a CD from Kurahashi that he wants to look into. Ryuji is heading to Kamurocho, weapons just arriving in the city, and Takashima is ready, but he says he still has an ace in the hole, apparently one step ahead. Back at Kamurocho Hills, Kaoru is trying to brute force her way into the disc, but she can't get it. She heads to Osaka PD to get into the information. Kiryu heads to talk with Kaoru at Serena because he thinks something is wrong with her. Kaoru regrets finding out the information about her past. All it did was hurt her. Kiryu takes this moment to finally make a move, and the two seem to be falling in love. <laughs> She promises that whatever happens, she'll make it back. Kazuki is awake at the clinic and Kiryu heads to see him. Kazuki reveals he was locked up for six months by the mafia. He overheard conversations about their plans to blow up Kamurocho, bombs planted around the city. They believe there are 31 bombs in Kamurocho, and Kiryu needs to go to the Tojo HQ to warn them about the Go Diu clan's invasion. They're shorthanded and can't lend an officer to form the ranks and rally the people to defend the city. Daigo decides to step in and rallies the troops. <laughs> いいか。Finally getting back his purpose, that charisma that we've heard so much about. At Purgatory, Date says the police don't want to assist, and Kiryu says they'll have to handle this on their own. He sends Daigo and his men out to defuse the bombs, and Kiryu will handle the Go Diu. Majima shows up and bashes his head against the desk, activating the secret compartment underground with his own cameras in the city. The florist helps to pinpoint the bombs and the tojo go to get them deactivated. Yuya, Emoto, and the barkeep from Bantam are all calling Kiryu, saying that the Omi Alliance men are storming their businesses, signifying that the siege has begun. He defends each place and finds Ryuji at Stardust, having already defeated Yuya. He tells Kiryu to deal with the bombs, saying that he wasn't behind them, and then find him at the highest point in the city, to finish all of this. Kiryu lets Yuya know it's people like him that keep Kamurocho alive. The last bomb is being defused by Majima, and we get a pretty funny scene of him randomly picking wires based on intuition. Unfortunately, the bomb explodes, and it seems Kaoru was dreaming it all. A little bit of a fake out. Kaoru has cracked the disc and finds something important that we are not privy to, yet. Kiryu heads back to Purgatory and finds Majima, having successfully defused the bomb with his supreme mastermind intelligence. Majima tells him to not lose against Ryuji because he needs another showdown. The lasting bond of these two to challenge each other's strength is amazing. Kaoru is supposed to return this evening with the information, and Kiryu plans to go after Ryuji. Until then, he wants to enjoy the city with Haruka. 
Before that, Date meets Kiryu at Serena to tell him something. He made a copy of the disc and had it analyzed and reveals that Ryuji is the other child that Kaoru's mother gave up, the two brother and sister. Kaoru doesn't seem to realize this information. Kiryu seems to want to keep the information from her, not wanting to hurt her again with her past. Date and Kiryu head to Tokyo PD, and there they find a video from Kaoru. She knows that Ryuji is her brother now. She doesn't want Kiryu to meet Ryuji, but she's going instead. She can't have Kiryu die because of how she feels about him. She wants to try and talk him down. <laughs> それでいいのよ。やっぱり私とあなたは住む世界が違うんだもの。心を許した私がいけなかったのよ。それだけあなたは素敵だった。ごめん。笑顔で別れようと思ったのに。あなたの言う通り。This scene of Kiryu slamming the table and walking out is so incredibly powerful. He's finally found something good and it's going to slip through his fingers again. He can't lose it this time. Kiryu heads to Kamarocho Hills while Date and Sudo try to get police backup. The final sequence is almost like a raid style dungeon set in Kamarocho itself. We have to knock down barriers and fight waves of enemies throughout the city. It takes that formula we've seen in so many buildings and places it on the city. Now our city has been taken over, not just the Tojo HQ, and we have to fight for it. At the top of Kamarocho Hills, Kiryu finds Kaoru trying to talk down Ryuji. Jin Goda himself is there too, Ryuji having recaptured him from the Jingwa. Kaoru tells Ryuji of his parentage, being a child of the Jingwan Mafia. Jin met his mother years ago and they had a child, him keeping Ryuji to make sure he was safe. Ryuji is shocked by the news but doesn't care. The grudge doesn't affect him, he only used them to make the war happen, so that he could battle Kiryu and prove himself the best. <laughs> おのれを信じて突き進む。ふん。知ったようなことを。俺の親友だった男によく似てる。戦うことこそが生きていることの証し。そういう男には俺も全身全霊をかけて答えるぜ。<笑> Finally, again this battle that we've been building up to the entire game has come to fruition. This time we have, in my mind, a better villain. Gota doesn't take that long to defeat, his health bar isn't that large and using heat actions makes the whole thing even easier. When he goes down, Jingwan troops arrive, led by Tarada himself. Tarada reveals that he is the final survivor of the Jingwan massacre, his true name Daijin Kim. He's been leading the Jingwan this whole time. He faked his death to start a war and get rid of the Tojo clan, thus getting revenge for the raid that happened all those years ago. Kiryu prevented all that from happening though, and now Kim wants to kill him personally and take down the rest of the Tojo leadership with physical force. Things are about to get a little complicated, Dad, so just make sure to hold on to your pants, because the finale is pretty wacky, as if it already wasn't. But this is where Yakuza is at its best, because even if the twists and turns are a little out there, you can't say that you saw them coming. They're always surprising. Kim, who I'm just going to keep referring to as Tarada to make things less confusing, says there are still bombs around the city. 
We get a flashback to Kiryu at the raid 26 years ago, and Kazuma walking away, letting Kurahashi and Tarada survive. Kazuma begged Jin to watch over Tarada, and he gave everything to him, but Tarada still couldn't forgive him because he was part of the Jingguan. Their creed takes over everything else. Kiryu faces off against Tarada and his men, and of course, we defeat him. This battle is a little annoying, but nothing we can't handle. Tarada likes to shoot at us with his SMG from afar, but we take him down regardless. As he falls, Takashima shows up and shoots Kiryu and Jin. He's been working with Tarada the whole time and eventually crosses everyone, deciding to take all the power for himself, killing Jin and Tarada. Tarada activates a bomb with a 10 minute timer, not enough time for any of them to get off the building. お前Kiryu, Ryuji, and Kaoru are the only ones left standing, and the bomb is about to go off, not enough time for any of them to get out of the building. Kiryu and Ryuji decide to spend their last moments doing what they were meant to, fighting to the death. だったら今すぐ。うっさいよ、ボケ。ねえ。わしら。もうボロボロ <laughs> These shots are so beautiful, well crafted. The music behind brings an emotional feeling to the whole thing. These two are finally at the end, and they're going to do what has to be done. This is the actual final battle, and Ryuji has a massive health bar. He's a pretty difficult opponent just for the sheer amount of hits he takes. At the end of the battle, these two take their final clash, hitting each other one last time, and Ryuji is the one to go down. Kaoru makes her way back to the top and gets to spend one final moment with her brother before he dies. Ryuji was a fantastic villain. He knew what he wanted, and he took it. He wasn't insane. He wasn't crazy. He didn't have a grudge from ages past. He knew that he couldn't survive, that there was no point in surviving if he didn't achieve his goal. That type of determination, that drive, has to be commended. And he has a conscience. He has morals. He's not a villain that kills and maims for no purpose or power or money. He does what he does because this is what he was born to do. The thing inside of him, in his soul, drives him forward, and he's chosen to go with it, not against it. When he dies, there's only a few minutes left on the bomb. Haruka, Sudo, and Date are in a helicopter trying to save the two from the exploding tower. The two decide to spend their last moments as Kiryu is bleeding out and a bomb is about to go off beside them, together. The helicopter can't get close enough to grab them, and they spend their last moments in each other's arms, finally happy. A fitting end for our hero and his love.
After the credits, we see Haruka praying at a grave, which is revealed to be Tarada's grave. Kiryu didn't die. The bomb was actually a fake, meant to distract Takashima so Kiryu could stop him and not let him take control of the clans. Tarada's last effort was to help them out in the end. Kaoru arrives at the graveyard and the three get their happy ending. Kiwami 2 has one of the best stories of the entire Yakuza series. It is fantastic. There are so many twists and turns and emotional moments. I think the biggest change from the first game is our main character and the way he approaches life in general. In this entry, he's so much more thoughtful and inspiring. He seems to have changed in the way that he looks at the Tojo clan, the Yakuza in general, and his past. He still holds these sentiments about the city and everyone he cares about. He wants to save the Tojo clan because it made him who he was, but he's not loyal without thought. We also get to see Kiryu happy with someone new, but... Of course, seeing him have to go through so much pain and strife to get that is trying. Ryuji is a fantastic villain that's kind of hard to hate. You feel for him in the end because he's a product of what's happened to him. He's definitely done some bad things and he's still a villain, but his determination and drive make him what he is and make us understand him, which makes a good villain in the end. Overall, seeing Kiryu get his actual happy ending, pulling a twist on the previous game's end, is also great to see. We actually get to see him live out what he wanted to at the end of the first game. That's not entirely the end of the story content that Kiwami 2 has to offer, though. The remake added another story section called the Majima Saga, focusing on the man himself. It's pretty short overall, but picks up directly after the events of the first game and helps bridge the gap between the two. Tarada is introduced as the new chairman, and some of the Tojo clan men aren't happy about it. Uematsu and Ibuchi are two new patriarchs that have risen quickly due to shady practices. Ibuchi explains Tarada's new Tojo clan reformation plan, which will give more to the families with the highest profits. This will determine who the next clan captain is, which will be Uematsu, not Kashiwagi, even though he has seniority. Majima rolls in with a ton of money, having just sold the Kamarocho Hills plot for a ton of yen, and by the new rules, should now be the next captain. <laughs> Tarada shelves the issue and Kashiwagi scolds Majima for the stunt he pulled. He knows that Uematsu will be out for revenge now. Majima heads back to Kamurocho and Kawamura, one of his family members, asks him about his opinions on the new rules. We get a pretty good insight into Majima here and his loyalty to the chairman. In public, Majima has this crazy mad dog face, but when he's serious, he isn't just this stupid, wacky, insane guy. He's plotting, he's ahead, and he knows what's going on. Majima is attacked by some assassins that say he should be worried about his own family. When he arrives back at the offices, his members have been beaten by the Uematsu clan. Heading to the Uematsu offices, he finds the man himself dead, shot by someone in the head. The Majima story doesn't really introduce any new sub-stories or mini-games, it's more or less just a short narrative. We can't upgrade Majima's abilities, but there are some new mechanics. Street bosses will appear pretty quickly for us to take down. These are the same that the main game has, except they're all thrown at us at once. We can fight these guys to get plates, which can be pawned for money. But if there's really no point in having money because the story is so short, what do we use it for? Well, we can send money to Kiryu as a homecoming present, and we'll be able to see that in our main game, which is a nice little touch. Majima heads to the Florist of Sai to get information on who killed Uematsu, and he learns Kawamura was there moments before Majima arrived. At the Cabaret Grand, we learned Kawamura had a debt to pay, but runs into the former owner of Odyssey, Yamagata. Majima picks up a lead to a massage parlor, and I have to interject a quick note here. So, because of the order that I decided to do these videos, we haven't played Yakuza 0 yet. If you don't know, Yakuza 0 came out before both of these remakes. There's a lot of references in both of them that have been added to tie in better to that prequel. The game covers a lot of Majima's story, and because of that, there's a huge scene here that has a ton of impact on that overall story. 
Because of that, I've decided to save this part for my video on Yakuza 0. This is because 1. To explain its impact, I'd have to spoil the plot of Zero in its entirety, and 2. The impact would be lessened by the time we got there. It also doesn't have much of an effect on this overall plot, and more of an effect on Majima's character in general. So don't worry, Dad. We'll come back to this. Majima gets information that Kawamura murdered an Omi Alliance member at Cabaret Grand and heads there to confront him. Ibuchi shoots him and reveals that he exploited Kawamura to get him to kill Uematsu. He wanted to start a war between the Omi and Tojo to seize power from Tarada. Ibuchi commits suicide to try and inflict further conflict between the two sides, rather than be arrested. Majima and Tarada decide to disband the Majima family, an apology for what Kawamura did. Majima leaves the Tojo clan and forms his construction company in Kamurocho Hills. This little story was nice, and shows how Majima got to where he is, and also gave us some more information about the clan in the aftermath of the first game. I think it shows the beginning of the rot that was to plague the clan for the next year. Like I said though, the real impact with Majima will be revealed later. After we finish the game entirely, we unlock Premium Adventure, as usual, and are allowed to wander around Kamurocho, completing sub-stories, taking part in mini-games, and just exploring the city in general. Because of that, it's now time that we talk about Yakuza 2's distractions. Like I've said before, the modern Yakuza games seem to follow a general structure of having a bunch of small to medium-sized mini-games, and then two larger ones that are more fleshed out and include their own story. This isn't necessarily the case with the PS2 version of the game, as the mini-games were still relatively small at that stage in the process, but the remake adds a ton of content to explore and get into. The first of which is Majima Construction. The Majima Construction minigame is mostly lifted straight from 6, resembling its clan creator. The whole thing is based around a series of battles that almost act as a tower defense. You have a set amount of defenders that you can switch around and organize, who will try to defend a target that waves of enemies are attacking. We start the whole thing with a few employees, and can hire more by scouting, which costs money and gives us a random drop. We can also get more by completing the Majima Construction story, or beating street bosses, defeating people in the Colosseum, and sub-stories. Each employee has their own stats, ranking, and field of expertise. These four fields are Attack, who do higher damage, Defense, who are better at taking damage, Balanced, which do both, and Support, which are slow and attack from range. Employees also have abilities that can be activated in battle to boost other employees, deal damage to enemies, or even gain extra cash. We can train each of these employees with certificates that we receive from completing missions, which will increase their stats and abilities. We can also fortify our HQ by spending yen to increase the amount of health each of the items we need to defend have. So how does the defense actually play? Well, we set up our employee in their defensible positions, but we can move them any time throughout the battle. We earn cash throughout the mission, which can be spent to level up employees in combat. This is best used as a health pack though, because they gain all their health back when you level them. We can also use this cash to activate abilities throughout combat, which can help us deal with tough situations. Each mission will usually have one or more bosses, and as the missions go on, they'll get harder and longer. <laughs> Overall, there are 17 story missions and 7 side missions, the final one being the most difficult. Now, as a concept, I don't really have a problem with Majima Construction. It's a neat little idea and is a mini game with a pretty complex dynamic, but when you really get down to it, this thing just goes on way too long. I think shortening each mission by 3 to 4 waves would make this whole thing a lot less arduous. By the time you get to the last story mission, it has almost 2,000 enemies and 16 waves of battle. It's just ridiculous how long these things take, and it gets really old pretty quickly. Not only that, but the story associated is just as long and boring. One interesting thing to note is that all of the enemies in the story are based on real-life Japanese wrestlers, which is actually pretty cool. The story basically boils down to this. There are a bunch of realty companies that want to get a hold of Kamurocho Hills, but Majima doesn't want to bow to them. Some of them have personal grudges, wanting to prove themselves as they're getting older. 
They send waves of their goons at us and eventually attack on their own. When we defeat each of them, they join our team and we can use them as an employee. It's just that simple, but 10 minute cutscenes drag this out into being way more than it needs to be. We do get the pretty cool Majima construction theme though, which has become a huge meme. The second large minigame, which is much better and way more interesting, is the Cabaret Club Grand Prix. This game was lifted mostly from Yakuza 0, but it still works fantastically. The whole minigame revolves around a cabaret club called Forshine in Sotenbori. These clubs provide entertainment for men, who can get a booth and have a girl provide them flirtatious or interesting conversation, essentially paid company for the evening. In Kiwami 2, we are in charge of running the shifts at Forshine. We have a number of girls in our employ that we can use to make the shift run well. Each girl has their specialty, talk, party, love, or skill. Some girls are moderately good at everything. Some girls are really good at one thing. Girls also have a style reflected by their ranking in each of four categories, sexy, elegant, cute, and funny. You can't really have a girl that's good at everything. All of these stats will determine how well a girl matches up with a customer's interests. If we pair a girl that is high in talk and elegance with a man that wants love and funny, he's not going to be happy. The closer we match those interests, the happier they'll be. Girls all have their own ranking, determining the potential their stats can reach once leveled, going from bronze all the way up to diamond. The important hostesses are the platinum ones. These girls are special in that they are generally better than the others, and they are the only ones that can get makeovers. The makeover section allows us to change the outfits, accessories, and even hair of a platinum hostess. This will affect their rankings in sexy, elegance, cute, and funny. Though, like I said, there's no getting an S in every category because it's always a give and take. This results in us tailoring a girl to fill each hole in the team. Every time we open the club to run, we can choose our team of hostesses. We can obtain more platinum hostesses through the story, obtain bronze, silver, and gold ones through scouting, which costs money and works similar to the Majima Construction minigame, and substories. Crafting a team takes a bit of planning. The first time you use a hostess, their mood will be high, represented by the pink smiley face in their portrait. Using them too much in a row will cause them to be overworked though and provide less than satisfactory results, so switching out from an A team to a B team every other night is advised. Actually running a shift works like this. Customers will filter in and we have to fill their booth with a girl that they hopefully like. Each customer has a ranking that shows their affluence, poor, average, rich, tycoon, and requests. Requests are when a customer wants a specific girl and won't be the happiest unless he gets her. A customer's affluence determines how much money they're willing to spend and how much you earn during their time there, so tycoons should be prioritized. During their stay at the club, the girl may need some help from Kiryu. This is when we step in. The girl will give us a hand signal so as not to interrupt the conversation. These hand signals can mean refill ice, ladies glass, guest glass, menu, or towel. If we correctly interpret this quickly, the girl will recover HP, or hostess points, which determine how long she can entertain guests, and we'll get a bonus order from the guest. When the guest is ready to leave, we can give them the check and ask them to extend their session, which will give us some bonus money, give them a gift to increase their mood, or a variety of options to increase the girl's HP. This is generally how a shift runs, but if we match customers up with the girls they don't like, there might be some trouble and we'll have to step in. We have to correctly stop them from whatever the trouble is and this recovers some HP for the girl. The fever gauge in the top left will slowly increase over time and has three levels. We can activate this gauge to start a party at a few or all of the guests' tables. This will bring us extra money and start the cash flowing for the rest of their time there. When they're in this party mode, we can give them a gracious send-off or an expensive gift, which increases the fans we obtain at the end. Once the shift comes to a close, which lasts 5 minutes real time, we get our profits for the night, which is a lot. 
The Cabaret Club is the easiest way to obtain money in the game. We also get a certain amount of new fans, which will increase the amount of customers that come into the club during a shift. We can obtain more fans by partnering with businesses around town for a small fee. When it comes to the actual story, someone is poaching people from Club Forshine. They need Kiryu to be their new manager, and when he proves useful, Kanzaki, the man that's poaching people from the club, shows up. He's kind of a bad dude and has been harassing the club. We enter into the Cabaret Club Grand Prix, which is a competition to rank all of the clubs in the area. We have to compete in four different leagues, the Fresh League, Paradise League, Executive League, Millionaire League, and one final championship. In each league, we get a new crop of customers and fans. We also sometimes get handicaps like only being able to have six girls on a shift or losing the platinum hostess Koyuki in the final league. When we earn enough money in one league to challenge the champion of that league, we can go into a championship match. These are similar to a normal shift, but we have to earn more money than the other club. The other club can also use their fever gauge, which will decrease our gauge and make customers leave our club. Each time we compete against a rival, their hostess decides they don't want to work for Kenzaki and defects to Forshine, us gaining a new platinum hostess. Eventually, we get to the final championship, Majima having to step in as announcer because the previous one was working for Kenzaki. The story is pretty simple, but it knows it's simple and doesn't try to drag everything out like the previous minigame. Each Platinum Hostess also has their own sub-story associated with them. Once they reach level 10, you'll be able to take them on a date and choose conversation options. You'll get a ranking based on how well you talk to them, and this will determine how much experience they gain. This happens three times, and after that you can complete their sub-story, helping them out with whatever issue they're having. Koyuki has someone who is stealing her underwear, and we have to find the culprit who turns out to be a patron at the club. This minigame is fantastic in general. It is so incredibly addicting, and every time I play it, I just want to keep going and see how efficient I can make this club run. I have to admit, I'm a little bit of a sucker for management games, so this one is right up my alley. Leveling things up, upgrading employees, increasing efficiency, it's incredibly addicting. It's a fantastic side piece of the game that's just so well crafted to keep you interested and to make sense right off the bat, even though it seems a little complicated. The only feature I never really used too much was the makeover section. I don't really see the appeal in the whole dress up thing, but that's just me. I would usually add some earrings or glasses to switch a hostess's style up a little bit, but wouldn't go much further beyond that. Since we earn so much money from the minigame, it's about time we head out on the town and use that money by getting into some other activities. Starting with one that I think Kiwami 2 does fantastically is restaurants. Kiwami 2 introduces a hunger gauge to the second game. This is also in Yakuza 6, this game sharing a lot of similarities with it. The hunger gauge will fill whenever we eat food at a restaurant and will go back down after we fight. We can take a medicine called Apstim that I believe is basically a laxative that will decrease your hunger gauge. Because of the hunger gauge, we can't really eat infinitely, therefore getting a ton of XP isn't possible, unless we use the Apstim. Combining these two, we can effectively farm experience, so restaurants and foods become a pretty important part of finishing that completion list. Now, this isn't why restaurants are fantastic in this game, though. Part of it is the UI upgrade. Everything looks fantastic with the delectable pictures of the food, the XP balancing makes you actually want to use them to get powered up, and the completion list rewards you further for ordering every item on the menu at all of the restaurants. With these three things, we have a piece of side content that acts as its own minigame, its own distraction that's just weaved into the gameplay seamlessly. We can also enter into restaurants without loading screens now, so it makes it much easier and more realistic to actually get food. Another distraction that's returned from the previous entry is lockers. In both Kamarocho and Sotenbori, there are locker keys scattered about the city, and we can use these keys to unlock specific lockers holding a variety of gear, weapons, and items. This entry for some reason puts a lot of the locker keys right out in plain sight for everyone to see, which I thought was a little odd. 
A new introduction to this entry is Bouncer Missions. The bartender at Debola has some jobs for Kiryu as a bouncer. These see us running through the streets of Kamurocho, fighting off waves of enemies and bashing through barriers. There are tons of weapons everywhere, and it's in our best interest to use them. For each mission completed, we get a new weapon and eventually have way too many to keep. The missions start off pretty easy and get way harder as they go on. Each mission has its own difficulty level with 26 missions and 3 difficulties each, that's 78 different non-unique missions. It's kind of a lot and eventually they change from just kill the boss at the end to smash all of the crates within the time limit. We can also fight out on the streets of Kamurocho, just the random thugs we'll encounter wandering around the city. Fighting enough of these thugs will eventually bring out a street boss. We'll get an email and we can go fight this street boss, him giving us a reward for winning. If these two distractions don't satiate your need for fighting, there's always the Colosseum, which has returned in this entry. It's pretty similar to the last one, just with a new battle system in place. As far as the smaller games go, we have all the classics. Mahjong, Shoji, Karaoke, Golf, Koi Koi, Poker, Blackjack, The Batting Center, UFO Catcher, and more. We can play darts at the bar, go to the golf center and practice our shots, watch some videos at the shop, and even take some pervy pictures in the photo booth. But as usual, by far the most time we'll be spending in the game is on sub-stories. If you're not aware, Yakuza's side quests are called sub-stories, and they're just that. Usually little self-contained stories that pop up as you're wandering around either of the cities. Again, I'm not going to talk about every single one here as that would take up too much time. I will be talking about a couple from Yakuza 2 on the PS2 though, because there were quite a few that were cut for the remake. As for Kiwami, there's quite a few bangers in this one. While heading through the story, we encounter a man who wants us to work on his video game. This starts the substory, Kazuma Kiryu, professional voice actor. This man wants Kiryu to do some VA for his game, and he reluctantly obliges. Once he starts reading the words on the page, though, he realizes that this is a game about two boys in love, and it gets a little steamy. Knee Deep in Trouble sees us finding a man in the bathroom at the children's park who seems to have had an accident. We have to get him some new underwear, and once he changes his pants, we get the best line from Kiryu possibly ever. Tah! He becomes an ally which will allow him to help us in battle if one starts near him. We're all in this together sees Kiryu helping out some students who are getting ready for a mock interview. We have to answer questions and build the other students up, but some of the alternative answers are hilarious. Kiryu being a little too open about his time as a Yakuza. Welcome to the Modern Age sees Date trying to get an internet connection set up for his daughter, Saya. He wants Kiryu to sign up for the service first, though, and tell him how to set it up so he'll look cool in front of his daughter. We sign up for the service, but Kiryu hates hidden fees and gets pissed when the company calls him and asks him for more money. He eventually figures out it's a scam, and when they want to charge him a huge cancellation fee, he beats them down. Date calls after this and tells him he didn't sign up for that service because the guy at the store told him it was a huge scam. Yeah, that'd be totally stupid for someone to do that. The legendary dragon sees Kiryu finding two imposters in the champion district that are dressing up like him and Shinji. He finds them again outside of Jewel and beats them down and they eventually decide to stop being imposters. It's just really funny to see a slightly chubby Kiryu. One of the most infamous sub-stories from the entire franchise is Be My Baby. This gets triggered when we're walking down Pink Street and have to fight some Gondawara family members. The Patriarch apologizes after the battle and invites Kiryu into his club to make amends. The club turns out to be one where all of the members are dressing up as babies in diapers and having women take care of them. Kiryu is not into this at all and they decide to fight him because he didn't take the apology. One pretty infamous substory that was removed from the Kiwami remake was the Adam Host Club substory, which sees Kiryu becoming a host for the Adam Club. This whole thing was replaced with the Cabaret Club minigame and honestly probably works better overall, but we don't get this scene. <laughs> Sorry, 
Yakuza's sub-stories are always outlandish and comedic. Some of them can even get dramatic and darker in tone, but most of them are lighthearted, fun, and pretty hilarious. These extra stories just add another element entirely to the game, and it's so fun to have these little adventures around the city. Yakuza 2 overall tried to revolutionize the story of Yakuza. It took the story that the previous game presented and pushed it the rest of the way, hyping up the stakes, starting a full-out war between the Tojo and the Omi. Everyone is double-crossed or double-crossing. There's body doubles, backstabbing, and unknown siblings. It's a fantastic story that really keeps you on your toes at all times because you barely know what's true and what's false. Kiryu himself again goes through a ton in this game, just wanting to rebuild the Tojo clan and bring it back to an organization to be proud of again. Something that would be worthy of the sacrifices that Seda and Kazuma made the year previous. In doing this, he's pulled into everything, a huge war that he doesn't want to happen in the first place, family drama, and even a love he didn't expect. But as we all know, when Kiryu gets what he wants, it comes with a whole lot of strings attached. Helping Kaoru find her past becomes his real mission, because deep down, he feels responsible for everything that she's had to go through. He's also dealing with how he feels about his past and the events over the last year. With all of this going on, Ryuji is in the picture as well, this presence that's incredibly demanding, powerful, and exhibits an aura that almost can't be challenged. But that challenge is what he lives for, and the only man that can do it is the only other dragon. Kiryu himself. This rivalry is the driving force behind Ryuji. It's what he lives for, to take down Kiryu and rise to the top of everything he knows. But in the end, he just doesn't make it. That doesn't matter though, because he had to do this. He always had to do this. It was in him from the time he was born, even if it means giving up his new family or the chance of on top of that, the game itself is on full tilt this time around. Combat feels fantastic and the new engine and physics system makes it feel incredibly rewarding. The side content introduced in this entry is also amazing, making it feel like there's never a moment that we don't have something to do pre-50 hour mark. There's some stinkers in there for sure, the clan creator isn't all that great, and it all comes at the expense of removing some pretty important things from the original version of the game, but again, both of these games are fantastic, and they're some of the best in the series. Yakuza 2 was the third best-selling PS2 game in Japan in 2006, and had over 800,000 sales in its lifetime in that country. It didn't do great in the West, only selling 40,000 copies in North America. Despite this, many American publications gave it rave reviews, GameFan actually giving it their Best PlayStation 2 Game Award for 2008. With the success in Japan, Sega decided again to immediately move forward with a third installment in the series, this time on next-generation consoles. 